Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining this SIBC ANZ webinar this evening. The theme for this evening is education as an asset class. And we just want to run through a few um, formalities before we start. Um, so just to let everyone know that we will, we will be recording this session, so it will be available on the SIBC ANZ website, and we'll provide details of that at the very end. Um, also as well, um, throughout the presentation, you've got the ability at the bottom of your screen to hit the Q&A session. Um, it's where you can actually sort of log some questions as you're going along. And what we'll do at the very, very end, um, after each of the pres presenters have finished um, discussing their topics, um, we'll do a, a combined Q&A session. Okay. So before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which I stand today, the Garikal people of the Uyghur Nation. Also acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Okay, I'm just giving you a quick update on um, where we are just now. Um, in the background, we've got a lot of um, initiatives happening in it, and Engineering Buildings is just one of them. Um, engineering Buildings is an online digital magazine um, and you, this is a free magazine and it's written by engineers for engineers and we also have a lot of um, guest presenters that sort of um, contribute towards that. And one of our speakers, um, uh, Graham, is actually in this magazine, features in this one and Dave featured in the one previous actually as well. Um, you can get this um, at the bottom of the screen there, you can just go to sibsy.org.au um, and you can get on the distribution list for that as well. There's a number of interesting um, articles within, the, within this um, edition um, and please feel free to uh, give us some feedback, see what you think and if you're interested in um, sort of contributing or if you know someone in your organisation who would like to get involved, please do let us know. The next slide is the SIBSI ANZ seminar series and um, it's a virtual seminar series which will be happening um, very soon. Um, you can see here that there's a number of um, very, very well, well established speakers there um, and the programme itself brings experts from both sides of the Tasman to share exemplar case studies of regenerative and net zero building practices as well as new information of future policy changes that building owners and service engineers need to understand to minimise risk to assets, both existing and new. So in addition to 10 presentations, this event will offer delegates the opportunity to participate in deep dive thought leadership focused sessions, learn from additional international case studies and other net zero CBD webinars, speed network in small breakout rooms, which is pretty cool, and learn about the products and services that can help you tackle the climate emergency and help you deliver net zero buildings. So again, you can see at the bottom of the screen, you can register there and there's a special early bird um, tickets that you can get, which will actually finish end of this month and then it'll ramp up. I'm not too sure what the price is, but I think it'll be a little bit more than $99. Okay, okay. Um, we've also got a plethora of other events happening in July, as you can see. and um, all of these events are available um, for registration on our SIBSI website. We also have a SIBSI e-newsletter which you can sign up to and you'll get, you'll get notifications of when these are happening and also future events as well later in the year. Um, these are all CPD events in this webinar format as well in exactly the same sort of um, situation we're all in at the moment where you know, the majority of people are still working from home. Um, and again, you can register at the bottom of the screen, um, sibsi.org.eu. So ARBS 2021, um, it's just a reminder that that um, it's been rescheduled for to the 15th and 17th of February 2021 and it's going to be in Melbourne this year, Melbourne Convention Centre. Um, just to remind everyone or, or just give a quick overview for people who do not know what ARBS is, it's Australia's biggest HVAC and refrigeration trade event which showcases hundreds of new products and technologies which are set to shape the future with a focus on emerging trends and technology in the areas of smart IoT solutions, automation and control, refrigerants and energy efficiency, plus much, much more. So it's over three days. Um, visitors connect with manufacturers and distributors to see the latest products um, and applications whilst exploring leading design and innovation in the HVAC and refrigeration industry. And so SIBSI is actually a, um, a, a member of ARBS um, and we um, contribute a lot to ARBS and ARBS, ARBS do a lot of us um, sort of initiatives as well with SIBSI, so encourage everyone to get involved. 
And you can visit SIBSI as well, um, at stand 82. So without further ado, we'll get, the, we'll get the evening started. I'm going to hand it over now to Dave Keening. So just before I hand over to Dave, um, just quickly introduce Dave. Dave is the National Director for Science and Research at the CBRE Asia Pacific Advisory and Project Management. So let's give a little virtual applause for Dave Keenan. Over to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Paul. And can you give me a thumbs up, Paul, that you've got my slide? Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sibzi, for the invitation to present and to Phil in the background, who uh, stopping us pressing the big red button and crashing it. Um, so as everyone is aware, we're in, in, in unprecedented times with regards to COVID and the impact felt. And obviously it is ongoing. The news out of Victoria is a concern. And while the image clearly shows we rode the first wave, let's hope this current spike is kept under control for all our benefit. Of course, the impact of COVID has been acutely felt in the education sector as most, if not everyone on this webinar is well aware. Um, when COVID hit, it is fair to say the mass migration to online teaching was incredibly fast. While online had been a growing trend, it's fair to say the catalyst of COVID certainly was a massive push to everything that could be online, um, with almost three quarters of actions being such a move. An incredible reaction from the university sector in such a short time frame. They really did move heaven and earth. Now that the move to online has occurred, there is an opportunity to reflect on the appetite of campus versus online. As noted on the attached and on the data we've looked at, the majority of students want a physical campus and real person-to-person -person experience. Certainly as part of their education, and I think for my part, that was an important part of going to university. So while we've had the initial jolt of campus closures and moved to online, we now have an opportunity to revisit and reevaluate what the priorities might be for staff and students with regards to providing and receiving education services on campus and the probable new balance of physical and online. So while um, Graham and Alex are going to talk on the design side of things, um, and I'll try and steer away from that, um, I'll focus on the property, hopefully. So with the closure of campuses and international travel restrictions, there has been a significant impact on university revenue. This isn't new news, but certainly at the core of the challenge being faced right now, and perhaps the elephant in the room of finding a way out. As shown with the exponential curve, the sector's increase in reliance on international students have been significant, um, with approximately $16 billion expected to be lost in 2023, or by 2023, um, directly. And also the trickle-down effect to the economy at large. I did read today in breaking news that international students might be allowed to return in advance of the various states and territories reopening. So perhaps international students are about to return sooner than later, so we'll wait and see. As many of you will also have noticed, the federal government has recently intervened on student fees and with the levers government has at its disposal, is seeking to drive more students to STEM subjects. This is obviously a multifaceted move by government and the impact is still being assessed by the sector. It certainly caused a lot of um, uh, attention. In the glass half full approach and the positive in terms of driving student numbers and in turn investment towards STEM, this is a positive move, move to build on the outstanding foundations that we do have here in Australia. And it is important in current markets for those glass half full moments. So in terms of STEM reform, what might that look like? So in, in pushing towards STEM, it's reasonable to presume the knock-on benefits to the strategic priorities for Australia. Another aspect of COVID was, of course, the sudden realisation to many in the community on how dependent most countries are on others for goods in particular. The sovereign risk of securing stocks of PPP and essential equipment such as ventilators, was a very real issue for many countries to work through, just as it was here in Australia. From a science and research perspective, both from education and R&D, noting they are often intrinsically linked, we continue to have challenges to address in energy, security, technology, environment, food and health. All of these, the higher education sector is crucial in addressing. This is one of my favorite slides that I'll be sharing with you today. Um, I really like the curve and believe it is a great reference to where the opportunities are and where we are going. In a globally competitive market, it is important to shift focus to where Australia can compete and obtain maximum benefit. In shifting our focus to either end of the value chain, we can exploit our fantastic R&D and technical abilities and move away, move away from adding minimal value as part of a larger production line. 
we can no longer rely on the ability to dig up and export natural resources to drive the economy and not and really where can we add the value so yeah like i said i think that curve beautifully articulates the opportunity in terms of case studies and, and real world examples in advanced manufacturing following on from the previous smiling curve we have seen the, the real push to address some manufacturing opportunities immediately in the reaction to covid i.e ventilators and ppp ppe longer term the future is looking incredibly positive and through forums such as the advanced manufacturing growth center we are seeing the move locally for r d and industry to add value at the front and back end of the cycle where the ip and therefore the value exists most for us to exploit a key message here is that the industry is already moving in the right direction and will continue to need academic partners with regards to space the last couple of years have been fantastic for australia perhaps best acknowledged by the creation creation of the australian space agency only last week there was a yet another great example of private enterprise and academia overlapping the example I'm uh, referencing is RMIT, working on new fabrics for future spacesuit development. This pipeline alone is expected to be circa 12 billion by, 12, by 2030. And quantum technology, CSIRO recently launched their roadmap and where they have earmarked potential market value of $86 billion by 2040. Commercializing these technologies will create a new high growth industry with the potential to create economic growth and jobs across a range of sectors that, of course, Australia needs to be in the middle of. As an aside, I highly recommend Googling for those on this webinar the, the, the CSIRO quantum roadmap as it is a fascinating document. So we have a government focus, we have some leading industries and great universities and education providers. So how hard can it be to make the magic happen? Unfortunately, it's not as simple as build it and they will come. As noted in the quotes above and the time, uh, time delta between the two, you'll notice the evolution of the definitions show the nuances as lessons are learned and we see to continually improve. Innovation precincts take time to develop and need to be situated within an R&D intensive ecosystem which, which relies on an open, competitive, regulatory environment and good government. Another very simple image that I believe shows a very logical evolutionary pathway of building an innovation precinct is hopefully on your screen. Of course, these challenges take time and have multiple factors to consider, but most importantly, the fundamental building blocks, the initial cluster. In the context of this presentation, it is pleasing to note the fundamentals for the Australian market are solid and are there for us to develop from clusters through precincts to districts. So what might we consider as factors for success? They might include market drivers, such as strong demand for goods or services, competitive pressure in the sector to innovate, access to emerging markets, skills and investors. By way of competitive advantage, the clearly defined market advantage or sector specialisation that is communicated through strong branding to attract and retain talented workers and financial investment. This will be supported by pro-productivity regulatory settings. In terms of collaboration, facilities and programmes to support collaboration between diverse organisations, from spaces for informal social collisions or bump space, as we often refer to it, through the commercial frameworks for joint ventures. Infrastructure is always critical. The physical transport and digital infrastructure that supports research, innovation activity and business connectivity within and outside of the precinct. Amenity, a vibrant and livable location that attracts people to work, play and live. It offers a sense of place for participants in the innovation ecosystem and the workers that provide ancillary services and is underpinned by flexible adaptive land use and is well designed for local cultural in infrastructure and finally enterprise culture um, strong entre entrepreneurial culture risk-taking collaboration and sharing of ideas this culture is supported by mentoring programs and a diversity of organizations and workers and is influenced by the culture of the anchor institution and of course underpinning that we need leadership robust governance, strong leadership, political commitment and shared visions. So looking at examples, the first port of call when I was invited for this webinar was to my colleagues in Boston where, where they were in unprecedented growth in the life sciences sector. While circular, the drive for more space to conduct R&D has fed the growth of jobs and in turn the economic benefits of attracting the best talent. The salary delta is noted in the slide and the knock-on benefits of course trickle down into the economy at large through accommodation and other public services and infrastructure. I also note um, the, the vacancy rate for life sciences in Boston is as low as 1.5%. It's an incredibly hot market. 
Another colleague I checked in with um, is in Texas, who noted the push in response to COVID for new large-scale health and care research facilities, in addition to what are existing significant resources. Many people will have heard of the Texas, Texas Medical Center. It's, 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 it's massive. Key to this development are those existing R&D intensive organizations. And I know my colleagues quote in the final paragraph, refunding, attracting funding. I also wanted to include an example of some alternate funding coming to the mix. The UCMA said project has recently been completed and is therefore, while pre-COVID, it is noteworthy from a finance perspective. By way of a disclaimer, I am explanatory and have seen and appreciate the upside opportunities of PPP. And I think it is fascinating that this university project is also the largest P3 in the US. Australia has quite a varied appetite when it comes to PPP, so we continue to be a niche market for the time being, but we, we will see people exploited for the opportunities thereof. Following on from the P3 slide, um, I've included this as another snapshot of the funding potential and opportunities. Obviously, with significant funding available and demand, we're seeing interest from investors from multiple angles and backgrounds, from trusts, private equity and the like. Where there is a market, the money will flow. Some local projects for context to touch on. Uh, Melbourne Airport. With significant land holding and soon to be improved connections to the city, it is pushing ahead with great growth ambitions and vision to attract and develop their very own health and research interests of significance. And also in Melbourne is the much lauded Fisherman's Bend development. And in preparing for this webinar, it was great to see yesterday's news that planning submissions are off and running. And to my understanding, there's a planning vote occurring today, although well, again with the news coming out of Melbourne, Perhaps not, but anyway, very soon there will be some big decisions made on on Fisherman's Bend coming out of the market, coming out. Um, again, you will note the stage one, two, and three time frame. It's an impressive development um, with an awful lot of exciting opportunity. In Adelaide, we have seen some great work at Tonsley Park, redeveloping former industrial land and noting the long-term play for a project that commenced in 2012. Um, watching it and being part of the development has been great to watch. It is not a short-term solution, as you will have noted from all these projects of scale. And in Perth, we're part of some great early work with regards to the Murdoch development. So a quick nod and shout out to my HDR friends on the call. So while there are some exciting developments in construction and planning, we also appreciate that clients will need to be particularly attentive on capital projects and priorities. It is not unreasonable in the current climate for estate planning teams to seek maximum value out of their existing building stock before embarking on expensive new projects. So our universities will invariably continue to challenge and test how they deliver teaching on campus. One example of shifting pedagogy is the advent of the super lab, where multiple classes can be taught in one space at the same time and squeeze that little bit more efficiency out of a building. Another tool universities will seek to explore is to challenge their space utilisation. Here's a screen grab of some data types that will increasingly be in focus as education and R&D industry providers focus on utilization and seeking to maximize that, where seeking to maximize efficiency where possible before pressing the button on new developments. And again, as a courtesy, as these are screen grabs I stole from HDR, but uh, knowing that they are, they're very active in this space. Another major opportunity to address um, in the current climate is the financial pressure um, that OPEX um, will, 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 will burden um, our universities with. It's another topic in its own right. Suffice to say that I hope to see great adoption and interest in sustainable opportunities and what are typically energy intensive facilities. Again, uh, and noting the SIPSI audience, I'm sure many people on this call will know laboratories and healthcare are the most energy intensive facilities um, overall to operate with significant amounts of energy sp um, spent on HVAC. Per this article, and Paul touched on it before, that in a previous edition of the SIPSI magazine, there are amazing opportunities out there by the industry adopting global best practice, and we would love, I personally would love to see those continue to be adopted and, um, and, and, and bring world's best thinking here. This slide I included quite simply because of the, the opportunity that exists in also 
not fearing that you can't eat the elephant in one sitting, that we can break the building and, and these facilities and assets into parts and also explore and tease out opportunities, whether it be the land, the building, chassis itself, the building services or FFE, opportunities for project finance, opportunities for refitting, retrofitting, upgrading, adapting and, and achieving greater sustainability outcomes are there in spades and there are plenty of opportunities. Um, and I just, I think, again, as we, as universities seek to address their balance sheet at the moment, those opportunities should be exploited. In terms of coming to the end of the presentation, um, the forecast remains upbeat for the education, science and research focus. Uh, and, and as you can tell by my signature file, that's, that's exactly where I like playing. Um, and all of that is notwithstanding the current challenges, the opportunities are there. There will remain a need for appropriate building spaces and typologies, a need for Australia to be globally competitive, a need to replace outdated infrastructure with, with a market that is pushing for more investment and outputs from the sector. There is and will be a limit as to how much teaching can be done virtually for a lot of the, the laboratory-based projects, uh, but courses, sorry. So what do future models look like or what might they look like perhaps more accurately? With international students, it's probably reasonable to think there'll be a potentially a shake-up of how much time is spent on the ground on the campus versus potentially doing some of their course portions thereof remotely just as this experiment has shown us right now. Universities will remain as essential as they have been throughout the response to COVID-19. It was again I trust everyone on this call saw universities were instantly um, contacted, their experts brought on board as part of the, the, the solution and how to address the challenges. A lot of the R&D push with the PPE and the ventilators, again, as a, as, a, as a case point that I keep referring to, were critical for those universities for, us, for access to facilities, access to the engineers, access to the prototyping opportunities and access to the open collaborative approach. Collaboration, Australian universities will continue to exploit those with their uh, local and international partners. And the student experience, which is going to be a nice segue to Alex and Graham, is going to be critical. The students want to be on campus, will need to access these facilities and want to have the best experience they can have. And then it is on us as property professionals to make sure that we give the best value for money outcome we can and maximise those opportunities. So I'll leave you with, with this final quote. When we all focus on the big things that really matter, Australian science and technology can solve seemingly impossible problems and create value for all Australians. This is from the Chief Executive of CSIRO. And I think it's a beautiful way of encapsulating where we are, the opportunity that we have, and the fact that we've got an awful lot of smart people that we want to back for our future successes. So on that, I will hand over to Alex and Graham. Thanks very much, Dave. That was great. Um, like you say, we're, we're away to um, hand over to Alex and um, Graham now. So I just want to introduce everyone to um, Alex West, who's the director of HDR, and also Graham Spencer, who's the director of Education, Science and Technology at HDR as well. So over to Alex and Graham. Thanks, Paul, and thanks to the um, to Sipsi um, for giving us the opportunity to speak. Uh, David, great presentation. Uh, it leads us to a nice segue in, in our presentation as we start as universities start rethinking their, their models of delivery and also their assets. And so one of the topic, well, the topic that we're going to be talking about today is one of those uh, new models and the, the movement towards um, vertical campuses. And we're seeing a lot more prior to COVID and now even more so with COVID, we're seeing a lot more interest in this particular uh, way of operating, the way of owning the assets or you know, leasing the asset. Um, delivering these types of buildings <clears throat> to still provide a you know world-class experience so Alex um, Alex and I are currently working on a particular project for Western Sydney University the one that you're seeing on the screen now um, plus uh, which is an 18-story vertical campus so we're going to share some insights really thinking about for you know for the SIPSI um, folks about some of those key issues when we, when you're asked to do a type of this, a building of this typology, some of the critical things that need to come to light. So um, yeah, so Alex and I currently just fast forward this, sorry. Uh, 
So yeah, look, we're just starting to look at the, the new models um, and what the future of our campus is starting to look like. You want to touch on that? Oh, it's, it's uh, <coughs> more about the, the whole agility within the, within the campus. Um, it's about creating an environment that is more student-centric. Uh, it's, it's about the collaboration with the industry um and and the community as well so obviously with the with the wcu model that uh someone we've looked at who's attending this some of you are working with us on this obviously you know about the the keen desire from wcu of integrating the community into the campus the that also requires an incredibly flexible floor plate and incredibly flexible planning, which then for everybody, the architects and the engineering teams, obviously comes with great uh, complexity in the early days. So when we start thinking about traditional campuses, you obviously see a quite a, <clears throat> a large, sprawling, horizontal campus. And now we have to take that traditional campus and then start rethinking that in a stacked manner. So what are the, some of those key challenges? Well, at HDR, we've really distilled this down to um, six sort of key design principles and we start thinking about those key design principles and this is not just through the work that we've done but also the research that some of the research we've undertaken um, and some of the tours we've taken through the US to look at some of the vertical campuses and some of it, and we want to and today we're going to share some of those insights there's obviously a number of um, of those key elements those key design principles we won't go through all of them there's quite a few there but um, I think tonight we'll just really share with you some of our some of our highlights would be of interest. So first one I'm going to talk about is the external spaces in the public realm. And that's the first principle, not just the building, but how the building sits within the overall um, public, <coughs> public realm and those types of spaces, which, which we've moved from a horizontal campus and now we're starting to think about in a vertical campus. Well, there's a number of examples of other vertical campuses which have not got that correct. You know, they've missed out that opportunity. So, you know, it's really important that if you, to maintain that magnetic campus, to maintain the, the ability for the students to, after class and before class, to come and find spaces where they can relax and socialize and continue their studies or continue their studies in a social manner, they need to be able to find those spaces within the building. And you want to make them interesting enough that the students actually want to go there and want to search out those places. So there's no point in putting some plants on a, on a terrace um, and expecting students to come and populate that space. You have to give them a point of interest, which then talks around the whole, uh, not just a sticky campus, everybody talks about the sticky campus, but trying to make it magnetic so that you attract the students in, you attract the community in, you attract future students in to want to go to that kind of campus. And these typologies of spaces really attract and form a strong, strong uh, baseline for that kind of activity. So the cities and uh, city terraces and rooftop gardens, <clears throat> supported by retail, um, are again, uh, are a key, a key element when we're thinking about designing these buildings from a services point of view, from an engineering point of view, that there are going to be requirements that we don't want the, you know, we don't want the staff and students leaving the building, um, going, you know, down to the local Westfield or down to the local, um, you know, to the, the local mall and then losing that that, um, that population. We want to find um, uh, opportunities within the campus itself to be able to provide those facilities. And particularly in the US, these facilities are managed and run by the students themselves. So the local pizzeria, bike shops, the little breakout spaces. But importantly, in these roof terraces, it gives us an opportunity to start creating um, community gardens. And so they had, not a, they had their, um, their life sciences providing genetically modified soils and looking at different opportunities to help provide a faster growth. And they were and combined with the agricultural research team, they were able to create just a, a beautiful community garden as well, which was able to provide food for that campus, but also provide a, a, an opportunity to be able to look at various um, research and engagement with students to be able to tend to those gardens. It's a really lovely um, stress release as part of their wellness at, approach that students could come out there and just plant seeds or pick strawberries. It's kind of a really nice space. Yeah, and give the students ownership. So to do what, how do you get people to go and uh, utilize a space is because they own it, because they've planted something, or because it's familiar. So the image on the left is just a Melbourne laneway, but if you make the space not so clinical, but um, 
relatable or familiar for the students, uh, this obviously plays very much into it. Yeah. So you can't have it too clinical and perfect. So that air conditioning can't be pumping there, make it a hot and unpleasant space. And so from a services point of view and from an engineering point of view, there's things that are going to be really critical, like uh, providing correct set downs and step downs within the structure. There's going to be obviously um, you know, a significant amount of water required onto this, uh, onto this level and how we treat that uh, from a landscaping point of view and how we treat that from a runoff and, um, and utilisation. So there's a lot of opportunities for grey water reuse. And so, we, you know, these are really um, beautiful opportunities that we just don't think of these terraces as a paved space um, that is, you know, just baking in the heat, particularly in Bankstown, it's going to get very, very hot there. But actually spaces that's going to be like, we talk about in our, you know, in, in residential point, uh, spaces that it's our third living room, you know, or an additional living room. Well, these are our additional teaching and learning spaces. So you can hold staff, you know, staff workshops out here. You've got the technology. So when we're providing for services, things that we want, we'll need access to is power, definitely out on the terrace. We want, you know, access to um, outdoor monitors and whiteboards and really make this a space which is actually engaging and allows people to use, uh, utilize that uh, for, for a much longer period of time versus a, you know, uh, let's say a, a paved terrace space baking in the sun. So you give them a purpose. Yes. So the, so as we started to think about the vertical campus experiences, there are a number of uh, key elements to transition from what would be a traditional horizontal campus, um, you know, like your, you know, your large sprawling green campuses and coming into a much more urban setting. Some of those key things are going to be you know, are fundamental to the success of a vertical campus. So things like, you know, we'll touch upon today, are they like the public transport links, um, industry engagement we've touched upon, um, access to retail. And so we're going to talk to those, um, in particular, the access to public transport. It is fundamental to um, the success of a commuter campus that you actually have proximity and clear access you know, secure access and safety. It's one of the chief concerns of students, young, you know, 18 year olds that are coming to potentially a new area and um, that they feel, they feel safe and secure. Um, there's always gonna be limited car parking on these sites. And so also providing that provision and, um, and uh, integration of public transport. Uh, Alex worked on a, a project at uh, PSQ and they've got a lovely opportunity where they're showing when the next buses are leaving and where the next trains are leaving. Just little um, thoughts of that nature where you're integrating with the IT and the um, IT um, systems to actually provide uh, that, you know, uh, bringing it front of mind, making it something that makes it a very easy, um, you know, an easy connection to the public transport. Yep. Got nothing to add okay. to that. <laughs> The entry experience, so the entry experience is obviously key, especially for a vertical campus. Uh, the, the desire of the universities uh, is, is really for everybody in this is community, staff, students, um, to come in and go, wow, so it needs to have a certain sense of gravitas to be in there. So how do you get gravitas? So we can obviously create it architecturally with space, but it's all about the lighting, visibility, uh, the opportunities for, for pop-up spaces which draw in the attention. So you don't want to have your pop-up space on level 13, you want to have it preferably at your front door. So you come in and go, wow, what are these guys doing? This is really interesting. So it attracts in the next generations, uh, pupils will walk by and see things that they're interested in. So when it comes to them choosing their university, they are more likely to choose the one that they've been looking at and thinking at. This is, this is something cool to be involved with. Yeah, it is their, absolutely their opportunity to make branding and identity. This is the, when the universities are looking to reassess their asset class and thinking about how they want to deliver. This is the, you know, the, the movement towards a leasing model and actually spending the money on creating the best spaces and the best experiences for their students. This is what we're seeing. It's their opportunity to, to really provide that um, wow factor into the ground floor. And, um, and the flexibility, is, um, as Alex says. So one of the other, not only just in terms of the entry experience, but one of the real challenges with any vertical campus is um, safety and security. Um, so on our tour, we, on one of the tours we took WSU on was um, went through a number of cities in the US and um, to look at various cent uh, student central spaces. 
Now, the approach to safety and security can be undertaken um, in, a, in a number of manners and a number of ways. And one of the key ones was the uh, New School, which is New York. Now, they, they are right in the heart of, um, of downtown in Manhattan. And what they, what they provide is literally you walk through the doorstep and it's a barrier, it's a security barrier. And it's a very controlled environment. It's a very, it, the school is an elite school and it sends the message that, you know, you, it's, you're not welcome in a way. You're not really welcome. And it was quite confronting going into a, into a space like that. It wasn't sort of one where you'd expect a typical university. I mean, across the water um, at Toronto, you've got the Ryerson University, which kind of played in, it took it the opposite way and really had this lovely grand gesture. Um, it's a large entry foyer space. Uh, the security team are, are there and they are visible, but they really rely on students to move um, in and around the spaces so just to monitor what's going on. Again, the universities have a very, very active student, um, you know, student relationship and student counselling and student uh, services. They have a very, very strong uh, student presence. So their approach was one of, um, you know, a, a more active and, uh, active and passive approach, whereas you can send, I'd say, the wrong message by providing quite a uh, fronting barriers. And that's the same, I mean, like Ryerson University had a, um, you know, had a, a drug clinic directly opposite and there was some, you know, interesting characters sitting there. They do find them coming into the, into the university and look, they, you know, they appreciate that. They just need to be, you know, directed um, elsewhere. So, you know, it's a, it, it was a much more welcoming approach. So when we're thinking about safety and security with a vertical campus, the, one of the biggest challenges is while we want the community to come into these spaces, and particularly the surrounding high schools, you know, they really gravitate. When you've got students that are coming out of high school and want to continue their studies, they will absolutely be drawn into there. And we want to, and the universities want to welcome that because they see that as their, their future, you know, their future students, their future clients. So they want to attract them. But one of the, the mechanisms that, you know, you really need to consider is how can you do that? How do you control behavior in those particular spaces? And a lot of it just comes down to simple signage that, you know, you can welcome the community in, but they're only able to, you know, informing them that they're only allowed to access up to level two. Then there's other ways where you can do with, you know, uh, making sure that the security is, you know, um, on the ground floor and visible, but also then providing opportunities where you can shut off levels and provide more secure access as you go further up the building. And there's an example of that working. So Parramatta Square, Western Sydney University's uh, first vertical campus was so attractive for the local high schools that they flocked to that campus and they populated all of the lower levels up to the point that the students couldn't actually find workstations when they wanted to find workstations. So the principle that we're applying for the Bankstown campus is that, well, we plan in for that for the large lower uh, levels. Then we have a student hub, which sort of separates all of those community engagement spaces from the pure learning and education levels up on the upper levels. Uh, so you see that in the medium teal sort of uh, in the middle there of that stack, that's our student hub. Um, with the main community being encouraged to populate the pink parts at the lower, lower bits and just the distance will diffuse the population mm. by the high school students. One of the, um, as well as safety and security, one of the success drivers when we're thinking about vertical campuses is vertical circulation. And uh, it's the number one issue in any vertical campus. You have such a high influx of students. Um, and so in this particular campus, we'll have 5,000 students moving through, um, through the building. Now, when, you know, uh, just to share David's love of graphs, we were just showing, um, showing the, uh, you know, we've done some current populate, you know, population um, and peak scheduling through here. We can we see that when the, the timetabling is looking at it, you know, you've got a need for 40 learning studios, 39, 44, 43. So they have these huge peak demands at nine o'clock in the morning at, um, and, um, and, and, you know, and very, then a massive drop off after that. So working with the university, you know, we've had to come up with, and we do this with not just WCU, but other, other, you know, other universities, start looking at, um, you know, to soften the curve and create that, to, to you know, to drop these massive um, peaks and flows. And to David's point earlier on about asset utilization, 
you know, we have potentially $5 million worth of assets sitting there not doing anything for the majority of the day. Now, the, it takes change, it takes a cultural change from the university, but also the impact that it has on car parking, the impact that it has on vertical transportation. It's actually critical from day one that we, you know, that the university and the consultants and the designers, um, you know, can manage, manage that process from day one, because if not, you'll either be under-servicing with, um, uh, with vertical transportation, or you'll be over-servicing it and you know, providing quite a significant cost to the project. So getting that balance is critical. Strategies around what we've done here and um, at another particular project is where we looked at neighborhoods. So not all universities, yeah, sorry, not all uh, levels are served. So it serves every third level. Um, and the idea is that you can come out onto that third level and you can either use stairs to go up and down. That means that you, instead of breaking down the, I'll be on level 13 or I'll be on level nine, you say, I'll meet you on the economics level or I'll meet you on the, you know, the, the so sciences level. You're actually creating neighborhoods and destinations. And that's a really, um, that's a really uh, good strategy in terms of servicing very, very tall buildings. And it encourages these bump spaces where you casually exchange ideas. So rather than making everybody go and stand in the lift and just change one level, which then occupies the lift for a very short distance in an incredibly inefficient sort of a way, you really encourage that footfall and that, that pedestrian circulation, which means people bump into each other on the stairs and exchange ideas, concepts, research, um, or just general chat, obviously, as well. Mm. Uh, but it, it broadens the horizon and, and it's very much in keeping with the university's aspirations. And one of the key things when, when you are looking at any, you know, um, any vertical campus is to create what we call our desire lines and that's those views, whether you're coming off a escalator, whether you're coming out of the lift or whether you're moving through on the stairs. Clarity, clarity of, um, of destination is key for uh, the students to be encouraged to use the stairs. You know, the escalators break down um, quite on a regular basis, they're expensive, so the, by, but then inversely you want to be able to encourage students to use stairs and, and allow them to, um, you know, free up the use of the lift. So having um, a clarity around destinations and views is a, is a key um, as a key design tool. And not having a long stair which just goes forever because then people don't go and take it. You need those little play spaces, these breakout spaces in there or have short runs of stairs so that people are encouraged to go and see them. They won't take a stair which ends somewhere where they can't see it. No, absolutely not. So when we think about space, this is, um, there are some a real key learnings in here. We're just going to touch on a couple of those, but one of the key ones that we've been working very closely with the universities is around providing agnostic, um, agnostic designs to their learning studios. So that means that they have a full, flexible, um, you know, approach to their to the configurations, and they have a thought and a flexibility of who can use those spaces. So we've moved a number of the universities away from having specific space, specific schools just using specific spaces. This approach means that we can set up a learning studio in 29 different arrangements. Now, for that, in order that to, to do, um, in order for us to do that, we need to be able to look at how we address things like power and viewing lines to screens. Yeah, absolutely. A great example for that one is uh, the very first time that, that uh, Western Sydney did one of these learning studios, we peppered the floor with um, floor boxes to enable students to go and plug in all of their thousands of computers. We also had uh, cows, computers on wheels, uh, associated with each table cluster. So everything was on wheels or is on wheels, um, but the problem turned out to be that the cows are actually really heavy to use. People don't move, to move, sorry, they don't move them because they are too heavy. It's too scary for the students to make the decision to unplug them from the wall and plug them into one of the floor boxes. And the floor boxes just stay shut because you've got chairs, etc., on them. So the lessons learned from that is now looking at more of the power rail around the perimeter of, of the space where you can see the, the power and the yeah. data. So it just triggers you to go and, and use the facilities because they're right at your eye height. It's not scary. It's like something that you're familiar with from home. 
maybe maybe not the power rail, but the, the PowerPoint itself. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and this was again, this came from our studies where, you know, students feel much more comfortable, particularly in high schools and kindergartens. And, uh, you know, they're so, they're so used to moving furniture and resetting them out themselves up in terms of chairs and tables. But that'll be the extent of it. So they're very uh, comfortable about switching to a uh, collaborative mode or a role playing mode. So they can, they, they can easily set up their, um, their chairs and they are, they are, you know, they're doing it quite, you know, quite regularly at high school. Now, and as Alex said, you know, hiding power and data points and access is, a, a, you know, is a, ends up being a failure to these spaces. Easy access, things that we've kind of said, you know, trying to make it more, um, you know, uh, accessible and, and, um, and readily available. It means that the students feel comfortable to be able to quickly reset because you can't expect the, student, the, the administrators or the teachers to be able to do this. Yeah, it needs to look familiar, I think. That's right. Um, and yeah, so learning happens anywhere, anytime. Obviously, we, we've all been talking about that for quite a while, um, about the casual learning spaces, bump spaces, etc. The, the, the importance for these campuses is, as we were saying with the social spaces earlier, is to create a, a smorgasbord of typologies. So make, the, make some spaces small, some large and open, some for groups, some for individuals, some for small groups, some for noisy groups. If you, if you give them just tables, uh, which they might be moving around to, to their heart's content, uh, it does not work as a space. So these, these typologies need to be then service in different type of ways. So a large group will obviously need a different type of air conditioning, acoustic treatment, and look and feel obviously as well to the space where an individual just wants to be in a cubby hole and concentrate. On. Yeah. And I think, you know, the success of a vertical campus is the balance and provision of informal learning. Um, again, there are a number of examples where behavior um, you know, behaviour of having these large collaborative spaces right outside learning studios, um, it causes conflict. It causes a conflict between the, ac the access to those sites, those, those places and the other activities that are occurring around them. So having a strategy from an acoustic level and, and working with our acousticians, so having a strategy across the floor so that the noisier activities, you know, are, are located near vertical transportation and as they get quieter and quieter as they go further out to the perimeter. And you'll find that students gravitate towards the, 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 the facades. Again, providing power. Providing power around the facade is absolutely critical. Um, we've seen a number of examples where power hasn't been provided and you'll see uh, trails of uh, cords you know, going across the floors, causing trip hazards. So, you know, it's that sort of, uh, it's understanding what the students require and be able to respond to that. Is, is one of the um, is one of those key principles. One of the other um, this, you know key um, elements is the industry and community engagement spaces. David touched onto that earlier briefly. Every university wants to uh, be seen to collaborate with industry partners uh, for for various reasons. That's a whole different talk altogether. Uh, but a university needs to supply spaces that can preferably double act as a teaching and learning environment as well as a large hosting type of space. And hosting for the community is different than hosting an industry function. So the magical word power, of course, yet again, mm. um, but it, it also comes with a specific look and feel. So the lighting levels need to be flexible. It doesn't, it doesn't work to just send in an electrical engineer, sorry for the ones who are online, um, and just put the, the satisfactory lighting levels in there. It's all about flexibility and setting up spaces in different typologies. So if you want to have the launch of a new product, you might want to have more mood lighting, more pinpoint lighting, Whilst if you're doing a community engagement and are talking about Diabetes Week, you probably would want to have a much more illuminated type of environment where they feel more comfortable moving around. The, as well as the industry engagement spaces, the, one of the, you know, it's not new, it's the mesh and maker spaces. Um, we saw a lot of great, uh, you know, we see a lot of great uh, spaces like that in Australia. We see some brilliant spaces in the US. This is the opportunity where you can set up to fail. That's the, that's the whole idea. And these spaces, 
need to have you know power coming down from the ceiling, flexible tables. They've got to be able to uh, allow students to have access to uh, a, a array of equipment, whether it's a uh, woodworking room, whether it's a um, AR, VR spaces. Again, the things will change and the needs will change. So there's a big push. They've touched upon, upon you know, with advanced manufacturing. There's a really big push in Australia around communications, um, cyber security. There's, there's going to be a change in need and these spaces are set up in a way that are meant to be, you know, like, like the shed. They're meant to be a little bit messy. They're meant to be a space where, you know, you, you know storage and access to those types of, um, you know, equipment is, is easy and the students feel comfortable in those spaces. So um, we're seeing a lot more of those. And when we start talking to, um, yeah, you know, our clients, the, the other one is, you know, yes, we've got technology, we've got engineering and mathematics kind of covered, but the science side of it, how can these, how can these spaces, particularly vertical campuses, suit uh, research? Can we, can we find ways and provisions to accommodate in the upper levels um, some opportunities for research? Now that will require right from day one, a really strong and um, a strong understanding around mechanical rises and access to those mechanical rises understanding what's happening on the plant roof. How can these vertical spaces not just be catered for the, you know, your social sciences and the like, but actually, you know, research and um, research sciences in that space. So um, at, uh, at the University of British Columbia, there's some really great spaces which um, serve both needs at the Brain and Mind Institute. Um, we've got spaces down at, um, at, the, um, at, um, at Portland that actually, again, are you know, encouraging the use of robotics and engineering. Flexible spaces, where we've completed one at the University of Sydney at Leeds, which is around um, it's Super Labs. Again, providing a, an array of um, research and research and education um, uh, requirements, but it can, catering all that within the one space. So it can be teaching chemistry and physics and, uh, and biology all in the same space. Um, and that's where Taking that idea and then bringing that into a vertical campus requires some really clar some you know some up some clarity around rises and in infrastructure and how we service those those two, uh, future needs. I think the clarity is the key part within that because mm. you want to be lightweight, flexible, and that's uh, the workplace is another one of those spaces. You want to be able to adjust to new typologies of working. You want to be able to work with the work throughout the work with the workforce, no, it's terrible. Uh, but <laughs> you, you want to develop your academic workplace with the desires of the workforce. So what do they need more? Do they need more group spaces? Well, you might change the school, which is within your campus at some point. In 10 years time, you might have removed the School of Psychology and put in more School of Education as an example. They have got different needs because they teach in different ways. So what does that mean for your workplace? Well, you might need more larger clusters. So how do you design a workplace which is flexible enough without being a large ocean of, of workstations which all academics react badly to because they want to have their little cubbyhole, they want to bring their own equipment, they want to bring their own books, they want to bring their own trophies of some awards that they've won at some point. And they want to look fabulous for the visiting academics. So the school wants to display the awards that they have won. So it's, it's not just a commercial office floor plate, which would work for this. You need to create environments, those neighborhoods are coming back in and make sure that you talk them through the different typologies of space usage so that you have your, your teamwork environments, but you also supply focus spaces where if they have to do markups or read a research paper, they can really go and shut off around themselves and don't need to hear to the guy next to them doing a student consultation or something mm. like that. So the, the creation of the smallest board of spaces is not just suitable for students, but very important for the academics and staff as well. Absolutely, yeah, variety is, is key. Sitting treatments is uh, one we've just thrown in for fun because um, these are student spaces. Uh, they shouldn't look like an office. You don't want to have boring ceilings in there. Uh, I, I personally, in a previous life to HDR, I've worked on a campus where we put in ceiling, ceiling uh, tiles, standard ceiling tiles, and that's the most critiqued part of that design every time we've taken somebody through there. So uh, these, these spaces obviously are very heavily serviced. 
uh, the desire is to have a floor to ceiling height or floor to floor height, which is suitable for a commercial office for future proofing the asset. So you don't want to build a purely educational floor to ceiling height, a good floor height, because it would just be much larger than any asset would require. You pay much more in the early days for that. So how can we make these academic, highly densely populated 24 seven spaces uh, perform acoustically, environmentally? And that is by thinking laterally on your, on your ceilings. So you can expose some of the services, of course, uh, but you can also draw your eye away from the underside of the, of the uh, duct by just playing a little bit with different and alternate materials. So an example there is uh, a, a, a ceiling full of uh, colanders, which we've used not in an academic setting, but it's a great example where you can, your eye really draws to the silver of the colanders. They've got holes in them, so your air conditioning actually works through them. So you never see the air conditioning ducts. But it performs nicely. It makes for an interesting space. Students feel comfortable. It's their familiarity of space with more urban settings. Again. Fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, identity and culture uh, is going to be one of those key things, those key uh, principles where universities are, is spending, you know, a significant sums of money in these buildings. So making sure that actually represents as a uh, representative of their um, of their culture and the identity of the students that are coming into this. Again, they don't want a blank commercial space. They're, it's actually a space that they want to feel very, uh, they feel excited to, to be a part of. They actually represent who they are, particularly within the community. So thinking about where these buildings reside within the community, who the community is, um, and for us and, and, and these projects is weaving through those different needs, the different communities, trying to find some synergies between the various communities and drawing upon those as, as um, design as design um, you know, triggers. So that is, um, and also spaces where I'm touched upon before is those, you know, really those key spaces where the students can go to and, um, and feel like they can socialize quite happily, be noisy, have, you know, have the band there, play, play snooker, whatever that is. They need those sort of spaces or they, again, they will leave campus to find it elsewhere. So, um, you know, and, and lighting levels. Lighting levels, yeah. Acoustic. Acoustic doesn't, shouldn't be perfect there. It shouldn't no, feel like in an office. Light, it's a lively yeah. space. Yeah. Buzzing. So, and also we touched upon lighting. Lighting is going to be a really key part of when we, you know, there's going to be strong visual art programs bringing in the community artists to, to you know, celebrate the the, the buildings, uh, the buildings opportunity and what it provides to the wider community. So again, providing lighting and access to those particular spaces. We've seen some fantastic, um, you know, static artwork and also dynamic artwork. But that's it's also a key part of um, when we're thinking about these vertical campuses. And lastly, our last principle is wellness and biophilia. And look, I think we've spoken. There's been enough, um, you know, enough past studies, current studies to, to, to note the importance of this. When you are moving from a very lush green horizontal uh, campus and going into, into these spaces, unfortunately it's often forgotten and it's more catered for the uh, commercial spaces. But you know, providing the use of natural materials, uh, not just for the student spaces, but also for the staff spaces, thinking about the staff who are, you know, who are going to be there you know, teaching all day and finding spaces for them to uh, have a quiet retreat, not be accessed by the students 24 seven. You'll hear that coming back through the user group program. So thinking about the types of breakout spaces, quiet spaces, you know, no phones, that type of spaces um, are really, really important. Uh, Biophilia, the, uh, the image on the right is from Georgetown University. Again, another student uh, central space. But a really beautiful use of uh, of daylight and and biophilia in those spaces. Bringing that greenery through the building is is important. And again, putting it into integrating it into the furniture, integrating it into the walls, finding those opportunities where you can is is is, is important. Not just for the not just for the um, uh, for the architects, but it's really important for the students and the staff who are using these spaces. And lastly, um, you know, there's there's a big shift uh, to use um, yeah, cross laminate timber, mass timber, CLT, and the, you know, this is actually a really beautiful opportunity for us to, do, as we're looking at these vertical campuses, to start integrating what what we're seeing, you know, whether it's 
uh, University of British Columbia, the NEST. Um, how can we use these as devices that are you know, uh, uh, beautiful? You've got the timber trusses here. It, it really speaks to, again, the core principles of the campus there. And they've got a fantastic sustainability um, you know, uh, approach to their campuses. Uh, world leading and you know they use geothermal uh, geothermal fields they use you know a lot of uh, cross laminate timber um, and I think we can learn from that in Australia you know absolutely and it's about putting that type of energy consumption benefit on display so you don't want the building to perform amazingly and nobody knows about it you want to you want to really really display it so that in the moment you walk in you go oh wow this 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 must be something special. So not just a tiny little screen tucked around the corner, which talks about how, how few wattages the building sucks up, but really make it immediately clear. Yeah, part of their core principles. Yeah. And that's it. That's kind of just a, an overarch view of, um, of some of the six key design principles that we that we like to use at, uh, at HDR and, uh, and how we're using that to inform our vertical campuses and taking what would be you know, um, a, an asset, but actually really reimagining these assets as a, a wonderful opportunity for the universities. Thank you. That's fabulous. Thanks very much, Alex. And thanks very much, Graham. That was a really good presentation. And as well as yourself, David, um, as well, that was great insights as to what's happening in the education sector. Um, grab yourself a glass of water and we'll... Um, we'll straight into the um, Q&A session. So if everyone's um, it's still on the seminar, if, you want, if you've got any questions, just please put them in the chat section of the Q&A session and we'll, um, we'll get to them in a second. Um, so just to, just to kick us off, so I've got some questions that I've written down from the presentations that I wanted to ask. Um, this is just up to whoever wants to jump in. So are you still there, Dave? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I can only see Graham and Alex at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm here. Brilliant. So um, obviously with the whole COVID thing that's happening, um, what's, what do you think the future campus models will look like, you know, with a high amount of funding emerging from overseas students? And how will universities you know, future projects, you know, going, going forward? David, do you want to say something about that first? Yeah, yeah. Uh, happy, to, happy to take that. I think, sorry, do you want to, somebody needs to mute. I think we're getting feedback. Um, from my perspective, Paul, and if I heard the question correctly, what, what's the future look like, notwithstanding the impact of COVID? I think the developments are still going to happen. They have to happen for the kind of, um, from a science and research perspective, I should say. Um, th there are too many factors and facets required in those facilities that you cannot do at home. There will always be a need for those contained environments, um, whether it's medicine, science, advanced manufacturing, there are an awful lot of those R&D intensive facilities that, that are needed, will continue to be needed, um, that, that you can't do at home. I think per, per couple of the comments I made, and, and again, it was something that um, Graham and Alex picked up on, there um, the, the, the will be a need to, squeeze efficiency out of existing buildings absolutely I think there will be a need from a prioritization perspective to spend that limited capital wisely for the time being um, and that makes perfect sense and I don't think anybody on this panel would argue that that doesn't make sense um, but you put all that to a side there is still a, a, a fantastic university sector there is still a demand for for the best and the brightest and we already punch above our weight, and I think that will only continue. Uh, Gar, Alex Graham. Thanks, David. Yeah, look, we can agree more. The, most of the conversations we're having um, over the, from now and probably over the next two years is around looking very, very closely at existing assets. How can we best utilize assets in the existing stock that they have? Um, how can we rethink um, delivery models such as the, the vertical campus model and going for leasing arrangements? Um, and yeah, uh, that's really where, you know, the, the, the need to be able to provide a quality in university experience is still paramount. You know, no one's taking a step back. Everyone wants to provide quality, um, quality spaces, quality experiences. Um, and, you know, there's obviously more opportunity with a, um, hybrid learning to be able to, you know, to, to use the term sweat the asset, that you can actually get more outcomes, rethink some of the timetabling. 
Um, you know, look across to the UK and the US about you know their timetabling and how well they use the spaces because these are expensive spaces to run. So. Uh, no, how can I possibly uh, add anything <laughs> to that? I mean, they, 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 we've, we've had a few discussions around uh, the effects in, in a uh, more immediate size for, for the Bankstown campus um, and people who were very precious about their specific learning space needs or the, the extent of office space required, their meeting spaces required, have actually relaxed over the last few months knowing that now you can have meetings digitally and they work actually quite mm. well. You can, the, 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 I think the forced learning curve on all of us has really helped academics to get more and more comfortable and also more creative with their teaching and learning um, provisions. So that now they feel a lot more comfortable doing the, the, the online yeah. sessions rather than before where they all and that, them. And that will change the space needs again. It will change the space needs, you know, in more little smaller booths, you know, breakout booths and, you know, that's going to be those types of spaces that become more prevalent as opposed to open planning. Nice, thank you. Okay, so how, how important do you think it will be for locations of campuses in the future then, um, in terms of the campus being located actually in a university campus, you know, because um, what we're seeing now is like precincts are happening, you know, with in like industry, um, you know, out, out in the West or whatever, or, or actually in city centres, like you were talking about there earlier with Parramatta. So how do you see the future of that developing, guys? Do you want me to go first? Yep. Um, so from my perspective, Paul, I think um, it was on one of my slides. I think for me, again, I'm, I'm biased. I'm, I'm speaking specifically towards the science and the research end of the spectrum. Um, there needs to be that cluster of R&D intensive institutions. So whether that's a hospital or a university that's got th those kind of interests, there needs to be that main player to go first, that anchor tenant, that anchor user. Mm -hmm. they, are the, they are the magnet that will attract the others. Um, and by attracting them, then um, other things come into play by which they can share facilities, share assets, whatever it might be, and collaborate fundamentally. So I think that continuum is real. I think we have some amazing universities that are already clustering and providing those precincts. And again, per one of my other comments, the, the also you can, it's hard to just build a, a thing and call it a precinct. There has to be an active um, embrace of, of the anchor, the vision, what is everyone there pulling to do? Otherwise you build a a commercial building and you let it to a mix a mixed bag, bag of tenants and you, you're not necessarily extracting the maximum value out of it so uh, the, hopefully that talks to your point paul mm -hmm. you got anything to add alex or graham yes again it's a big click pass I, I like the way how he just looks at me in that moment <laughs> um yes the purpose the, the campus has got to have its purpose and and how do you create a purpose so that you you do have an anchor and that is an in-depth um knowledge or an in-depth offering so it's it's that that uh, joining it up with the real life the people who are going to hire the students at the end uh, or an amazing research arm and you do that by layering the the different um, facilitators for for the desired outcome together so I think as, as David said the collaboration hubs are going to be more and more key yeah well you know taking a 30,000 you know foot view I think universities are, all universities are taking a look at what it's, what's their core and like, like a business, what's our core, um, you know, core delivery? Are we a medical school? Are we an engineering school? Do we want to be an advanced engineering school? Do we want to be the best education? You know, we all, the, you know, we want to teach the, the, the best and brightest teachers. What's our core service? And I think a lot of the universities are taking that time now to understand that they, they can't offer everything and that it shouldn't offer everything. And they're going to go back to that where they can have a look at what do we, um, what do we want to be the very best at? And, are we replicating something else someone else is doing down the road? Should we be, should we be offering the same? Why are we competing? What else can we do to, to make ourselves unique, to be the school to, to you know, to, to learn business, to learn law? What, what is it that we're, you know, what's our core, core offering? Like many businesses in COVID during this time, what's our core business? Mm -hmm. 
Great. Um, Graham, what's, what's the obvious design pitfalls that you've seen where vertical campuses might not actually work and why? You focused on the positive, but what about the you know, not so great oh, things? Look, the biggest challenge is structure. Um, yes. I think structure is one where we, um, we find that we, you know, like that particular building has a real um, strong, strong design and the structure needs to be such that you can provide flexibility within those spaces. So I think, you know, rises and, um, and structure are one of the real challenges with any vertical campus because, you know, um, that impacts greatly on providing agnostic learning studios. And, and, you know, when I say agnostic, I mean providing almost like a cookie cut, cutter arrangement of, um, of those learning studios because once you go into every learning studio is different, it's not good for the learning, it's not good for the teachers, it's not good for the, you know, students, they don't know how to use those spaces. And every, every space is unique, it's become incredibly difficult. Uh, so structure is one of the real challenges and, as I, and to me the make or break of any vertical campus is vertical transportation. Yeah. If you can't solve that, then mm -hmm. don't even bother. <laughs> you know, if, you can't solve it, <laughs> if you can't move um, you know, the better part of 3,000 students and there's, some, there's a couple of universities um, that it takes you the better part of 25 minutes to wait for the lift. If that's the case, it's just you know, students, mm -hmm. won't, students won't turn up. They would rather, you know, wait for the online course to come through and, uh, and rather wait two days and know that, that their experience of sitting there waiting 25 minutes to get onto a lift. And for universities, it's a competitive market now as well. I, I mean, there, there are so many universities which build great looking buildings, great feeling places. So you walk in and the acoustics are great, the lighting is great. It, it, it's, it's a cool space. Um, Students gravitate to the cool spaces. They don't want a bland office building to go to university to. Mm. It just doesn't attract them. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you said that. So that's clearly leading on to my next question. How, how competitive are the universities? I mean, I know, Dave, that you put a lot of posts on LinkedIn um, on regards to you know, the rankings. Um, so can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that and the rankings and how important it is on the campus to stay alive and sort of take, stay current for the students' experience? Yeah, I think the rankings are, well, they're only as good as their criteria, obviously. Um, but and, and the ones I'm sharing usually are from the Times Higher Education, of which is a bit of a, a gold standard of, of, of ranking. Um, they are important in just that simple attraction and, um, of students. So in terms of international students, they really do want to go to the blue chip universities of where their degree, respect, whatever it might be, law, medicine, whatever, um, is from the highest ranking uni. So it might still also have an impact on the dollars um, they're going to pay for that education, obviously. Um, but it is an incredibly competitive market. It's the same for the academics and the researchers that their universities want to attract and retain as well. Their rankings are important on their grant, uh, perceived or otherwise on the ability of researchers to attract funding. So, you know, the rankings for as much as it's there are a lot of them and it's in, and it's a ridiculously large field it does matter and you and at the end of the day you also want the uh, bragging rights of being the the highest ranking in your state or country or whatever and certainly at the in, at the academic level you also want to have your your particular niche to be the best um which i think it, it's good it's healthy to drive competition um but yeah i think there'll be a place for for, for rankings for a bit longer Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's an interesting comment, David, because the, there's, one, there's one quote which I love, you know, with COVID and everyone moving to an online experience, is, should students be sort of moving, should be paying the same amount? And so suddenly you're going, well, if you're going to SeaWorld and you're paying $5,000 a ticket to go see SeaWorld and all you get to see is the penguins, that's not really a great experience. I want to go see the orca whale, I want to see the big, you know, that's what I'm, that's what I'm paying for. So the universities are really try, uh, are finding themselves in this um, challenging time to go how can we give them that full experience and you know and provide them that online and if you're just providing an all online learning i think you're missing out on a there's a big missing piece of that and that goes to the rankings it goes to the um you know the synergy and the and the opportunities that you find at university both socially both academically there's so much more to be able to meet you know have those physical spaces provided just jumping back to the vertical campuses, um, 
I'm just going to the questions in the Q&A. So the instance where you spoke about the movable tables that were provided, and they weren't actually used was quite interesting. So do you have any other examples where students or academics were provided with a product or service that unfortunately was not used or even used in a way that wasn't intended? It might surprise you. <laughs> I think yeah. using in a surprising way it happens way. all the time <laughs> with students. <laughs> I think a great example for how things were overcomplicated are uh, there's, there's been a lot of R&D done in, into tables which can join up and form amazing clusters of, of uh, working groups. Um, like, and yeah, like fancy curves, hexagonal, parts, yeah. and also until you bring it together. But ask an 18 year old to put it together and they just, you know, yeah, it's what? what? And they'll ask an academic to go and rearrange and move the, uh, these spaces into these complex forms. It might look really nice on a, you know, on a brochure, but some, you know, what we've discovered, simplicity is, is king, you know? And integrated power is one where we find that while it's nice to have integrated power into the table, students will pull out the power from underneath the table and they'll plug directly into the floor box because some, you know, they just, they just don't know how, they're not, they, we kind of treat them like what they are, they are commercial clients and they're not. And just so having a PowerPoint on the wall services so much more of their need. What will happen is that they'll rip all the power out and then go and move that table elsewhere and damage it and damage the table and damage the, the you know, the floor box. So we see a lot of that. Simplicity, you know, is, is again, Absolute key familiarity yeah. to familiarity. Yep. They haven't learned how to behave in a commercial office yet. We are all, as the design teams, we're all familiar with table boxes, drawer boxes, etc., and how to work around yep. them. They're not. Yeah. And you're, and it's evident in the way that they treat the spaces. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. There's some interesting examples. <laughs> Awesome. Um, what's the biggest change you've seen in the approach to design and the layouts of um, university campuses in the last 10 years? And how do you think that landscape will change in the next 10 years, moving to the future? Look, I think the, um, from our tour and what we're seeing is that the reliance on laptops is allowing greater flexibility within the spaces. So I think we're going to see much more, um, more you know, the, the approach that we provided at WCU, we'll see a lot more of that in the next 10 years. Spaces which can be adapted and changed and flexible serves multiple needs. You know, you, you, you're building each each learning studio for over a hundred thousand dollars. They want to maximise that that asset. They can't just leave it. You know, like the old PC labs are ones where you know, you're moving away from because they're now more laptop based. So that gives them an opportunity to release that room into the timetabling to flatten out those big highs and lows and curves. So you can actually use spaces um, in a variety of manner. So I think. You're going to see a lot more of, of those um, and, uh, and I think you're going to see a lot more um, video and you know uh, video enabled video recording it's going to be a lot more reliant on AV within the spaces to be able to record those clarity to be able to hear the questions feel like you'll be able to raise your hand you might be a monitor you know, your face might be a monitor on the wall but still being able to engage into that particular learning studio we're seeing a lot, a lot of that in the US um, that the students don't feel like that because they may not be there, but they're actually missing out on that level of engagement. And it's the ease of, of, of that usage, isn't it? That's yeah. absolutely key yet again. So you've got to make it really clear, yep. easy to use from home, as well as um, when you are actually using the space. Yeah, buttons on the wall, like really obvious presentation button, a, you know, um, sharing mode and being able to to hit a button that spins the camera to your whiteboard. Things like that make it so much, uh, make those spaces far more familiar, usable and enjoyable. If you have to go and have an app and a, an iPad and try and find that particular setup and the like, forget it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. The, the academics have a very short period of time to set up and present and they're under pressure to engage with the students. They're there to engage with the students for, a, for the better part of, you know, it could be up to three hours. They don't want to spend 20 minutes trying to figure out how to use the AV. And so we are very cognizant of how we address that and make things, let's say, buttons on walls. <laughs> it's going to be, yeah. And it's flexible yeah. as possible. I think mm. flexibility, I mean, we, we all talk about flexibility. We've been designing for flexibility. It's becoming more and more important. Uh, so it's got to be more movable, more lightweight, 
uh, cheaper to change, uh, yeah. easier to change quickly. I, I think it, it's just everything is changing so fluidly. Um, mm. It's it's just crucial to have the space to be able to perform like that as well. Yeah, the offering from the universities are changing, so spaces need to change constantly. Mm. What about what about from your perspective, Dave? Because you do a lot of um, labs, don't you? Super labs and focus on the science part of things. Um, yeah, well, I think a lot of it, Paul, was is well, just taking a step back. Um, and while um, um, Graham and Alex touched on some great design aspirations, I also think a lot of those campuses and precinct developments will also revolve around those major infrastructure moves like road and rail, uh, well, less road, hopefully more rail. Um, and, th and that's why I included the Melbourne Airport reference as an example. That's a pre that's a that's a, an asset opportunity primed with that rail link coming on, online between the CBD and the airport. That that kind of future evolution will. It's all about the student at the end. Of, you know, putting the student at the centre, and you've got to be able to get from A to B. You've got to be able to have an environment that, that you want to be in amongst, and that will be that that, that um, where those opportunities of growth and development will be. From us, from a perspective, um, just like Alex and Graham were, were talking about this, the simplicity. A lot of the best labs are at the end of the day the simplest from a services reticulation and flexibility perspective there's, there are certain you know some people will get carried away and over design and over engineer and that's to everyone's detriment it's um i think we're going to continue to see a push for flexibility as best we can and as smartly as we can um in, in particularly in laboratory design where square meter costs are obviously that bit more expensive than a than a, than a non-highly serviced education space mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Um, I've got a good question for all of you, really. Um, so, what would be, from a lessons learned perspective, from an engine, you know, for, for our asset builds and service engineers, what's the key takeaways and advice um, you'd like to see engineering consultants take on board when you're designing a project or, you know, from start to finish, or might be something that's, that's happened from a personal experience, or, you know, it's open to you. What's, what, would be, what would be the key takeaway from lessons learned you reckon that? people should be taken away from this. Can I jump in? It to work for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, if I can jump in first, Paul, on that, and I think it's it's it's, a, it's obviously a, a, a convergence point with, with you and I2SL, but from a sustainability perspective, I think the engineering sector, and certainly here in Australia, we can be, we, we should be, and be more um, understanding of what else is going on out there globally. Yeah. and adopting of global best practice where we can. So and I know you're on board with I2SL and, and everything that it stands for. So the, mm -hmm. the more we can bring international best practice and learning to the, te to the table and to our community, the better. Um, and I think that's, again, it's, it's not about egos. It's about just broadening our knowledge, broadening our awareness, and ultimately our clients will benefit. And if we can um, yeah, yeah. reduce our energy use, we all benefit. So... I just wanted to get, I'm preaching, I know, but I just wanted to get that in there. Nice one, David. No, I, I think agree, yeah. I, like yeah. I think what, what I saw in, um, in Canada uh, was we are, I don't want to say so far behind, and I know the environment and the climate conditions, but the way they've embraced it, the way they've, um, the government's mandated it, it's, a real, it's, you know, it's so clear when you walk into those buildings how quiet they are because they're mechanicals, they're not pumping lots of air through the buildings, you know, just the, it's just such a different, it's just a different environment as soon as you walk in, you can just really get that sense that uh, the building's operating at a different level, thermal chimneys and, um, you know, and just different approaches um, to, and improvements, you know, the millions and millions of dollars are saving each year in OPEX by, by investing and in, in taking the time to really spend to say, okay, what is the best outcome? You know, should we cover the building and Elon Musk, you know, tiles, solar, solar tiles, what other ways can we actually really think about, you know, driving, driving great um, sustainable outcomes? That's what we'd love to hear. I think, you know, we as designers, as architects, we try and push innovation. I think from our side, we'd love to hear from the engineering and consultants, engineering consultants to be far more vocal about innovation and as opposed to being reciprocals and saying, oh, we'd love to do it, love to do it, but actually being really vocal and showing how 
and the, and really simple processes to be able to achieve those. Show us as well. Yeah. Lead us to go mm -hmm. and push the space. Yeah. So don't don't. I think a key takeaway, another one would be don't just design an office building. It's not desired in in the space and the performance of the space, and that that yeah. ties into the environmental thing. These are spaces which are being looked at from the community, from the future community, and from research partners, potential research partners. If you walk into a building which is vanilla, why would you want to go and team up with them and give them millions of dollars worth yeah. of research opportunity? If you can go to that one building, which might be a little bit warmer, but it is using thermal like a, 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 a thermal chimney or something like that, mm. which actually looks interesting. And I know a lot of these things have been around for a long time and some of them work better than others, but uh, sometimes it's, it's good to go back onto some of those things yeah. and see where they've developed towards. Awesome. Um, I understand there's a question in the chat. I can't see it. I'm hoping Phil is listening and he's going to read out the question. Phil? Yeah, uh, this is from Ryan. Uh, G'day, Ryan. How are you, mate? Uh, to the whole panel, do you think that we will see more private industry and public use of university facilities as we move through COVID-19 world and remote learning continues to grow? What do you think this may look like? Uh, absolutely, yes. Private and public industries are... Uh, critical to universities' um, success, their engagement, um, philanthropy, um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's already happening. And I look at the, again, not to labor the US, but I look at the way they approach commercialization, philanthropy, it's, it, it's embedded into the university. There's no, there's no separation or just a space. It's actually part of the actual university's facilities. Um, it's a very strong connection. If you, you know, if you want the world's best researchers, you need to have uh, private industry funding that. Um, and in terms of the, um, oh, sorry, sorry. No, David, do that. you wanna add to anything else to that? Yeah, well, ag agree. And I think um, from a base revenue perspective, the universities need to be and would, would bite your hand off if you turned up and wanted to use their facilities at yeah. the moment. It, again, it's a, it's a whole paradigm shift of, of sharing more now. And I think from a first, first hand perspective, I was lucky enough to be part of the ventilator response team and watching UNSW and Sydney Uni work with the private sector invite various start you know instant startups and and other levels of um, degrees of sophistication to come in and use the manufacturing the the the, 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 the workshops the biomed engineering testing facilities the prototyping that instantaneous collaboration and access absolutely obviously there was a great um uh, mission that we all agree with and the need for it was present but um it, it was another perfect example of turning this crisis into a positive and i think models will flow out of this yeah. um going forward yeah, you... <laughs> fantastic well thank you very much Dave Keenan, Alex Wesling, and Graham Spence. It's been very enjoyable um, listening to your presentations and the conversations you made afterwards as well. Um, just for everyone that's listening, this recording will be made live. Um, we'll send out a, a link afterwards, but it'll also be on the SIBC website, and you can get a link to that and download it anytime. But I would just like to um, do a little virtual uh, round of applause, and these things are really difficult sometimes. You can't appreciate, uh, you know, what's going on so just wanted to say well done guys so thanks very much um it's been great yeah thanks John. thanks for listening and then uh, we're going to end the presentation there so thank you very much thank, thank you everyone. Everyone. Good evening. bye